Hello, Robert Kiyosaki, and welcome to another exciting episode on the Capitalist Manifesto. And the reason I wrote the Capitalist Manifesto is because most people have no idea what communism, socialism, Marxism, fascism, totalitarianism is. And the advantage I had is I left Hawaii in 1965 and I went to military school. And at military school, we're taught different economics that's taught, than that's taught in liberal arts snowflake schools. So at military schools, when we learned about Marx and the manifesto and socialism and fascism and Hitler and Mao, our economics teacher taught us in body count. How many people did Stalin murder? How many people did Marx, not Marx, but Lenin murder, or Mao, or Hitler? And my concern is, I could be wrong, that America is sliding into socialism, and socialism is a step, one step before communism. So that's why I wrote the book, The Capitalist Manifesto. And what we're doing is we're interviewing people who have actually <laughs> had experience with socialism, Marxism, totalitarianism, fascism, and all this, so they can tell you their story. So today, it's a, it's a person I have tremendous respect for. So Patrick, welcome to The Rich Dad Show, and I'm honored to have you be our guest here. I am honored to be on your show. Thanks for having me. So I want to know, because you're, tell us about Iran, because you were a young boy, I mean, you were just born, uh, and it's still a flashpoint. So what happened to your family when whatever happened in Iran? We don't know. That, that, that's, uh, so I was born uh, October 18, 1978, when my uh, mother's water broke. Uh, uh, my father was taking her to the hospital. Tehran had curfew, and they were held up by uh, the you know security, and they had to find out what are you doing driving when there's a curfew because is it was midnight and my dad said well my wife's here she's pregnant we're having a baby they got escorted to the hospital then i was born so three months later the shah was in exile and then khomeini's regime came in and and that was a complete different lifestyle because when shah was in power in iran iran was trying to be more westernized so they wanted to have better relationships with america the moment khomeini came in it was a complete different story you know america's the enemy death upon america i would grow up as a kid looking outside the window from the fourth floor, seeing thousands of men marching, flagellating their back, saying death upon America. And when you look at the stats, what's so interesting about it, what most people don't know is if you go look at stats on travel and tourism, in the 70s, the top three countries in tourism in the 70s, Burma, Cuba, Iran, people around the world went to Iran. The rich people of the world would want to go to Iran for vacation. Elizabeth Taylor used to date Zahedi, which was the ambassador to U.S. They used to be together. The Dean Martins of the world, Frank Sinatra, they would go perform in Iran. And Iran had a very nice thing going for themselves. And then came the next regime. And when the next regime came, it was caused because Jimmy Carter's campaign at the time was all about human rights, human rights, human rights. And he had two countries as a target. One of them was Iran because they claimed that the Shah had 3,000 political refugees and that he had, you have to let him go, and that's not fair, and all this other stuff. Well, he ended up being forced to let him go. And those 3,000 political refugees, many of them ended up leading to the beginning of Osama bin Laden, which led to 9-11. So it was a ripple effect from who he had in control. And then the same thing Carter did when he was going against Castro in Cuba. He says, listen, all these people you're keeping in your prison, this is unfair. you got to let your people free. you got to let them go. And then what does Carter uh, 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 Castro do. He pulls Carter. He says, no problem. I'm going to send 125,000 political refugees to you. He opens up his prisons. He sends 125,000 inmates up to uh, up to Miami. Miami's un unemployment drops to 50%. Gas stations were shut down. He had to wait for hours to go fill up the tank. So one president hurt two nations and people were forced to leave. And who left Iran and Cuba eventually were the entrepreneurs and job creators who said, listen, if you bully us around, know this, the world always needs more job creators and entrepreneurs. Iranians went to Australia. Iranians went to Europe. Iranians came. They went all over the place. Cubans went all over the place, and they created jobs. So you're seeing some of the similarities of that taking place right now in America, because the moment we start demonizing small business owners, 
and entrepreneurs, what people forget to realize is the demand for job creators is very high everywhere around the world that's not socialistic and that's not communistic. So uh, what is it called when Khomeini, te Khomeini took over? See, I remember Iran was Mecca. I mean, it was, you know, it was, it was utopia. And the next thing you know, there's this revolt and this Khomeini comes to power. What is that called when it's a religious takeover versus a political, do you know? That's a scary thought. So, so I'll unpack it to you in a different way. So when the, the Iran was always known for having girls being forced to get married at a young age, when the Shah came and he increased the age, uh, Iran was known for women to not be able to be lawyers or have a voice or vote or any of that stuff. He gave more freedom for women. Iran was known for the longest time for not having control of the oil. OPEC was owned by, you know, Britain and all these other companies that came in and they controlled it. Shah came back and renegotiated and put a 25-year contract with France, Germany, UK, and US. And when his term was coming up in 1979, these four countries had a meeting together. I want to say in Mexico or somewhere in South or Central America to discuss, we have to get rid of this guy because he's becoming too powerful. Iran was a country when the Shah was in power, his relations with uh, Israel was good. His relations with US was good. His relations with even Russia was good. There was peace in the Middle East, so you didn't have to worry a lot about it. Well, then Khomeini comes in with uh, the, the religious side, and age of marriage went down to 13. Uh, then women's voice went away. You could no longer show your hair. You had to cover yourself up. Women didn't have the authority. You just stand next to me and don't say anything. Women lost power. But on top of that, there was a performer in Iran who was an incredible performer, and the people who knew the story really well, his name was Farrokh Zadeh, I believe, he happened to be gay. And in Iran, you know, people knew, but they're like, listen, you know, to each his own, you're a great performer. He was a show guy. People loved him. He was phenomenal on camera. Well, later on, when the Khomeini came in, he could no longer do what he did. So eventually he went to Europe, lived in Europe. They sent people. And if you want to really investigate what they did to him, it's brutal. I'm not even going to say what they did to him. But the point is, freedom left. It was no longer about freedom. It was about you do whatever I tell you to do. And specifically when it becomes religious, uh, it, 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 you know, where I essentially become God, I essentially become a connection of God. So whatever I tell you, you better listen to me because I'm more connected to God than you. So if there's God, then it's me. I'm pretty much the acting role of God. Very different kind of a situation that took place in Iran. Women lost voices. You know, a, a, a lot of folks lost voices. And there became a division between a lot of different people. And we obviously know what happened to Iran years later. So um, i ask you a very high-risk question, given the state of America today. Do you know they had a parlor, and parlors taken off? Mm -hmm. They come after the president of the United States. And, you know, Donald Trump's a good friend of mine. And he said some stupid things, but they shut him down too. It's, it's to the point where people, I don't know about you, but I'm afraid to tweet. I'm afraid to say things on YouTube. What, uh, and, and you and I are in the same business. Has it affected you at all? I mean, do you feel that same way that censorship, which is part of our society, in 2021? I mean, do you feel that or is it just me hyperventilating? <laughs> you know, there's no question about it. Yesterday, I talked to a sniper that I had on, Nicholas Irving, I believe, who is the first African-American sniper from the 3rd uh, Infantry Battalion from that unit, not the first African-American, but specifically from that unit. He has 33 confirmed kills in 100 days in Afghanistan. And I'm talking to him. I'm like, you know, we did AIT and here's how AIT was. And when we did AIT, our drill sergeants, he's like, no, that didn't happen when I went to AIT. So when did you go to AIT? He said, I went in 2010 to 2014. You know, that was his range when he was in. I said, I was in 97 to 99 is when I was in the military for two and a half years delayed entry program at the 101st. I said, yeah, drill sergeant could do this few that. He said, drill sergeant can't do that right now. I said, interesting. Then uh, uh, I said, uh, so how is AIT in boot camp today? Well, anyways, the point is drill sergeants have so much scrutiny today that they didn't have before, right? Which means... The soldiers coming out are softer today because you cannot challenge them because they can go out there and send an email and say, you offended me, it was mis inappropriate, all this other stuff. So 
I think what has increased the most, Robert, is the following. You know, you seem like a very good looking guy. And some tells me you have dated other women before getting married. I may be speculating, please. I hope I don't upset your wife, but I'm, I'm speculating that you've had a, a few different girlfriends in the past before. And, and for, from my end, when I dated others, you always had to adjust to the personality of the individual. And the most difficult, annoying relationship were when you always were walking on eggshell. Why'd you look at it? Why'd you say this? Why'd you do that? Why'd you do that? Your freedom left you and you were miserable. You couldn't enjoy life. You couldn't do anything. I think what is happening today with America, eggshells are at the highest ever. Everybody's walking on eggshells today. It doesn't matter if you're in the financial industry, if you're a leader, if you're an executive. Like You have to sit down and have conversations with your guys saying, listen, if you have somebody in your office, always leave the door open. You can no longer have, it's got to be constant open door policy. It's got to be when you're talking to somebody, always have a third. Like, I've never had this many calls, but I'm always having a witness today. Anything I do, I have a witness. Anything I do, I want to make sure second or third party is involved. Because for somebody to come back and say, well, here's what you said. Well, that's a speculation. But what if it's true? You know, and, and so nowadays, anybody can say anything about everybody. So, yes, I do think things have changed. Uh, I do think there needs to be adjustments. And I, I have a couple different point of view on this. I'll give you one other perspective on this uh, uh, for you to be thinking about and your audience to be thinking about. I think you have to know that there is a, there's a couple different things going on. One is the war between Republicans and uh, Democrats. Okay, so you got Democrats that have two different parties. You have the Democrats that are the moder moder moderate liberals, okay? And then you have the Democrats who are the AOC, Bernie Sanders, those Democrats, okay? On the Republican side, you have the uh, Lincoln Project Republicans, okay? The Bushes, the McCains, that community. And then you have the MAGA community today, right? You got two parties. Well, which is more competitive and which is more unified? We know they're more competitive because they want to be right. They're not unified. We know to them it's more important to be unified, but they throw each other under the bus behind closed doors, never on public. Big difference. They'll call each other publicly. These guys call each other privately. So they win. So strategically in an area of teamwork, which I remember one time uh, I read a message from Tony, Tony Robbins. You know Tony. You and Tony go way back. Tony said, the hardest thing you can ever do in a company is to teach teamwork. It's by far the hardest thing. Well, they got it down. They're a better team. Now, let me give you a completely different perspective. Teamwork. 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 Yes. The toughest thing you'll ever do is teamwork. Kids, wife, business, all of that. So here's the other aspect. Though. When you look at Republicans, Republicans lost the race, and it's been a 20-year race. And what do I mean by 20-year race? The Walter Cronkites of the world, they're gone. You, you're no longer going to have a Walter Cronkite. They're not even going to get the viewers that they got. 20, 30 years, that's just not going to happen today, right? Today is more, you have the era of the, you know, Cuomo's, the Hannity's, the O'Reilly's, the Tucker's, the Rachel Maddow's, Christy Tuck, very, very divisive, going at it, war, fighting match, they're constantly fighting, right? Republicans have lost the race the last 20 years because every single time LA Times was for sale, they bought it. New York Times was for sale, they bought it. Washington Post was for sale, Bezos bought it. You had Time Magazine was for sale, Benihoff bought it. You have Twitter that was on sale for $6 billion. No one on the right made an offer. You had all these opportunities that they didn't do. So what did they do behind closed doors? The left said, let's control media. The right said, just leave us alone. Let us be rich and billionaires and millionaires and let us just be free. Well, we have learned that today, influence has a very high level of currency and they have won that currency. It's gonna Absolutely. take two decades to fight with them and that's gonna be a tough fight. So the so the so-called the radical left. And besides, I'm being very clear. You can be a radical left. You can be a Marxist. You can be a communist. You can be, it's a free country. And I think what Patrick was saying was, they caught the Republicans sound asleep. They didn't recognize how powerful social media was going to become. And it's ironic that Patrick and I are in that business, but now we walk on eggshells. That's, I think that's the challenge. So it's a free country. This is my, my question to you then. Why did your parents leave? I mean, you're a, an infant. What caused, that's a, you know, that's a big move. You know what I mean, it's a big move. Why did they leave? It's such a great question. You know, Jennifer and I, we just moved from, uh, we, I was in LA for 24 years. She was in LA for 15 years. 
we moved from LA to Dallas and we lived in Dallas for five years and the freeways in Dallas are very difficult. So it took us a little while to get used to that and all the friends and everybody. And then we just moved from Dallas to Boca Raton. We're in Boca right now. I've been here for three weeks now, right? Little less than in three Florida, weeks, three Florida. Weeks. I, yeah, Florida. And, and, and I can only imagine going from California to Texas to Florida. You know, it's, you're still in America. You're still speaking a language, but to go from Iran where you have all the restaurants, contacts, friends, family, everything you've learned, the TV, the news, the people. Then you go to Germany at a refugee camp. Then from there you come here. You have to really push somebody to want to leave what they've been accustomed to and used to for 44 years. That's a long time to have to go learn two languages, German, then English. Very difficult. So what caused it? What caused it? It was a few different things. Number one, my mother one day came and she said, look, um, your son is about to turn 12 years old. She says it to my dad. If he turns 12, we have to stay here and go to the military. That concerns me. Number two, this is not the place to raise our kids long term. And my dad and her went at it back and forth. And then they finally agreed. And they said, OK, makes sense. Let's do it. Now, here's what's so funny. My mom's a communist. She's no longer a communist today. But my mother was a card carrying communist like, you know, Karl Marx or her whole, whole family. Most of her family, except a couple of people that were capitalists. And then my mom gradually went from being a communist to a socialist. And now she's just more a Democrat is where she is. And my dad was an imperialist. But both, whether you're a communist or an imperialist, you finally got fed up with the amount of control and force of beliefs being constantly imposed on you without you having the choice to choose which direction you wanted to go to. It doesn't matter what your political affiliation is. You eventually just want to be free. And they escaped and brought us to America because they thought it was a better opportunity for me and my sister and it was better for us to be free, where we can at least go out there and say, hey, yeah, I remember first time we came to the States, we're in uh, Granada Hills, we're watching the news, and one of the guys on TV Wait, said, um, he said, um, Didn't you go from Iran to Germany first? Yes. What, what happened there? I mean, that, that, that's a massive transition. Yes, we lived in Germany at a refugee camp for nearly two years, year and a half, two years, in airline. What, like? what was that like? You know, I tell you what it was like. It was my first experience of entrepreneurship because I had to learn how to make money. So uh, we, we don't come from a lot of money. So we had to learn how to make money and go recycle and, you know, collect beer bottles for a local swimming pool. And I got five Fennec every time I did that. But, but, the, but the part that, that was uh, for me, the, the base where we were stationed at, the camp that we were stationed at, there was folk that, the folks that escaped Yugoslavia. Uh, uh, Miodrag, you know, Anna Maria, like I remember these names. And there was folks that escaped Czechoslovakia, you know, Jan Stav, Katarina. There was folks that left Albania, Poland. And so when we would talk with kids, I was 10 or 12. So, so why did you guys leave? Oh, you don't know what happened to my country with communism? No. Oh, the country sucks. Everybody's trying to leave. We're just trying to get our visa. Why did you guys leave? Oh, you don't know what happened to my country with the war that's going on right now with social... And I'm like, I have no clue what you guys are talking about. I don't know what communism and socialism is. I just know my mom says rich people suck. And I know my dad says poor people are lazy. That's all I know. I don't know any communism, socialism, libertarian. I know none of that stuff. But I realized we were all escaping and simply seeking to go to a place that gave us freedom. So all kids, all we wanted was freedom. Did you have, did you have to learn to speak German? Oh, yeah. I spoke German fluently. Yeah, absolutely. I spoke uh, German fluently. I, I, you know, I, I have to tell you, probably one of my best life experiences where I grew and matured. I, I went to Germany as a boy because my father was there. But in Germany, I became a man because I had no other choice. You were forced to become a man at a young age. How old were you? How old were you then? 10 to 12. 10 to 12. Uh, uh, we escaped Iran July 15th, 89. We left Germany to come to U.S. November 28, 1990. So it's about a year and a half. And so you're saying that in this camp were people from different races and different countries all escaping? They were all escaping. And they all wanted one thing. Just leave us alone. Let, let us be free. You know. And then uh, was it a, a U.S. base? It was a U.S. It, it, we were by a military base in Erlangen. But it wasn't a U.S. space. It was just oh. a refugee camp that we were at. And uh, how, how did your father escape with any money at all, or your family? Ah, it's so funny you say that. So my dad uh, had money at one point, uh, but he waited to convert the to man to a dollar. It used to be seven to man to a dollar, and he escaped and converted when it was a hundred to man. 
to a dollar. So rather than coming here with a million bucks, three million bucks, he came here with a hundred thousand dollars. And a hundred thousand dollars is uh, he put in a ninety-nine cent store, had a few heart attacks, lost all the money, and went back to being a cashier at a ninety-nine cent store. My dad was a guy who ran a Max Factor. If you know Nivea Max Factor, that's what he did. And he worked for General Motors in Iran. I mean, my dad worked at General Motors for Iran, and he had a hundred employees reporting to him. He went from that to being a cashier in Westwood, California at a 99 cent store. What happened to his spirit? Crushed. But one day we're at a gathering and it was a Christmas party. I was 24, 25 years old. And some of these other uh, uh, folks who were there and part of the family who left a little bit earlier and they're doing good for themselves money wise. And they forgot that my dad was the one that everybody went to because everybody trusted my dad. And they were kind of talking a little bit disrespectful to my dad in a condescending way, not direct, but just kind of like speaking down. And I snapped that day and I said, dad, we're leaving. He says, we're not leaving. I said, I'm telling you right now, we're getting the hell out of here. I'm not staying here for another minute. He says, what are you talking? I said, they don't talk to you like that. I'm just telling you, they don't talk to you like that. And at that time I was in my party phase. I was always at the clubs. I was in Vegas every other week. I could care less about any of this stuff. We got in the car. I told them they're going to have to kill me. The world is going to know your last name. I guarantee you they're going to know your last name because they're going to know what a special man you are, what an incredible leader you are. You put everything on the line. You and my mom, you put everything on the line to come to America to give us an opportunity and you compromise your leadership position that you had. I said, you will forever be remembered. They're going to have to kill me for the world to not know who you are. And now everywhere he goes, Gabriel B. David, Valuetainment, Gabriel B. David, Oh my gosh, your son always talks about you. And I love that because now he's got a second wind. You know, he's living again. So for the first 10 or 15 years, obviously it was a very difficult decision. But now he's very glad he made that decision because his, the success and the habits he had is continuing through his son and his daughter. Where does he live now? He lives in Granada Hills. We're trying to move him to Florida. And <laughs> I, think, I think he is convinced that he's moving to Florida. So we'll see. So when did you when did you join the army? Uh, April tenth, uh, uh, April t April fifteenth, nineteen ninety seven. And were you already in the states? I was in the states. I came to the states November 20, 1990, and I went to high school. Right after high school, I tried college a little bit and worked at Burger King. Just wasn't for me. And then one day I just woke up. I said I'm gonna go to the army and uh, went to uh, Hummer mechanic in the army. Eventually ended up a Hunter Force Airborne Division, and uh, you know it was one of the best decisions I made. I got goosebumps, the screaming eagles. You know this, one of the best decisions I made as a military. Me too. It, it shaped me up because I was a surfer kid. You know, you know, it's crazy. Quick shout out for you. you. You've written a lot of books that I've read, but what's crazy is one of the books I read like the most was the, the thing about eight something military, I don't know the title of it. It's yeah. a green. Uh, eight rules of military leadership. I mean, it's such a underappreciated book. Everybody, whether you're military or not, needs to read that book. I had it as a book of the month for my guys six years ago, five years ago, because there is so much value in that. You know, sometimes you look at books and they should do better, but they don't get traction and momentum. And people think it's not. That was one of that book was just as impactful to me as Rich Dad Poor Dad was. Well, that the difference is, is that um, college is not about leadership. Do you know what I mean? It's not about leadership. And the reason I have tremendous respect for you is that I had, um, my family was put in concentration camps during World War II, as you know, in California. And I had two uncles fight against the Japanese. And then I, and then I came, I landed near Berkeley <laughs> at um, some Air Force base out there and I get spit on get called a baby killer. I just, I'm bringing my troops home, you know. And um, I was at Norton Air Force Base. And I don't think people know. And the reason I wanted to interview you is the bad side is what happened to us. The good side is what happened to us. They're the same side of, the, of a coin, you know what I mean? And when my, when my relatives were thrown in prison, concentration camps all up and down the West Coast, they lost everything. Do you know, so when I hear, you know, Black Lives Matter, they want to be given land and all that. So we never asked for that. My uncles went to fight for the 442nd, the most highly decorated infantry battalion in World War II. It put a fire under us. 
And I think that's what's lost today, Patrick. And I had two uncles fight against the Japanese. One was captured and tortured and castrated. You know, and then, but he spent his life in the army tracking down the guy that cut his nuts off. <laughs> he did. He's, I said, well, I think I would do the same thing. You know what I mean? But he became a full bird. He became a full bird colonel and all that. But do, do you know what I mean? And so when I hear these people bitching about stuff, I just go incredible. So I have tremendous respect because the the unit I wanted to belong to was the 101st, the Screaming Eagles. You know, I, I even had a folding M1 carbine because it's World War II vintage, and I carried that in Vietnam. Do you know what I mean? So, uh, any, anyway, um, our, our time is up, so I, I really appreciate your education and you know keep the, keep up the good fight. So thank you, Patrick. Appreciate you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And I thank Patrick, Beth, David, and thank you all for watching this issue of Capitalist Manifesto.